Hello, welcome to the Introduction to Proofs video on Mathematical Statements. My name is Professor Michael Polyuk. By the end of this video, you should be able to identify a mathematical statement, change the truth value of a statement by changing the scope of its variables. We'll explain what this means later. You should be able to create a statement using for all and there exists quantifiers. You should be able to translate a formal mathematical statement into English and you should be able to distinguish mathematical statements with mixed quantifiers. To start us off, what is a mathematical statement? I'll, I'll point out that this is not a definition. Um, this is just the idea of what a mathematical statement is. We'll see a bunch of examples. The reason for this is that to give a formal definition of a mathematical statement would require us to know a bit of um, mathematical logic and formal math that uh, is more appropriate for a later course. A mathematical statement is a statement that can be either true or false. It asserts that something is true, so it's actually saying something. It is precise and leaves nothing up to interpretation. So if two different people see a mathematical statement, they'll agree on what it's trying to say. Here are some examples of mathematical statements. 2 is less than 7. You can tell that this is a mathematical statement because it's reasonable to ask is it true that 2 is less than 7? And someone could give an answer yes or no. Um, it is true or it isn't true. In this case, it is true. Um, the second statement is minus 5 is equal to 3. Well, that's an example of a false mathematical statement. The third one is there is a real number z such that sine of z is equal to 10. One way to tell that this is a mathematical statement, again, is to ask, is it true that there is a real number uh, such that sine z is equal to 10? You can imagine asking that to a friend. And I'll let you think about whether this is true or false and what the reason is. Finally, square root of 2 is not an integer. So these are all examples of mathematical statements. They're all either true or false. And they're the kind of things that if you wanted to show that they were true, you would have to provide a reason. Let's look at examples of things that are not mathematical statements. So the following are not mathematical statements. 12 over 15. The naturals are the integers. 2 plus 3. x plus 2 equals 3. To tell that these are not mathematical statements, you ask, is it true that, and then fill it in with the, the expression. So for example, is it true that 12 over 15? That doesn't make sense. It's not asking, um, it, it's, it's, it's not true or false that 12 over 15, it's just a number. Same with two plus three. Is it true that two plus three is not a thing that you can ask? The final one is the most interesting because it's the one that feels most like it should be true or false. So is it true that x plus 2 is equal to 3? How might you answer this? One way to answer it would be, it depends on the x. For some x it will be true, and for some x it will be false. So this is a good answer. Um, when, we define, when we said what mathematical statements were, we said that they should not depend on interpretation, and two different people should agree on, the, on what the statement is saying. So in this case, we don't count this as a mathematical statement because it's not clear what the x should be. Let's talk about how to fix that. Now, our motivation uh, for mathematical statements is we want in math to make conjectures and to prove theorems. We want to know what is true. And only mathematical statements can be proved. So non-mathematical statements don't assert anything they don't say something is true or something is false, so we can't prove them or disprove them. Let's think of the statement x squared greater than zero. Is this a mathematical statement? Is it asserting that something is true? Take a moment to think about this and decide for yourself, is this a mathematical statement? If it is, is it true or is it false? Here the answer is no, because we don't know what x is. 
And the truth of this expression could change depending on what's called the scope of x. This means that if uh, two people think that x should be uh, a real number or a natural number or something like that, depending on what they agree x is, it'll change whether the statement, whether this expression is true or false. So let's look at some examples of changing where x lives and let's see how that turns it into something true or false. So all of these statements are, are mathematical statements. x squared is greater than zero when x equals zero. So that turns out to be a, uh, well, do you agree with that? Do you think it's true or false? And you should right away feel, oh, this is a false statement um, because then x squared would become zero and zero is not greater than zero. So because you're able to think, oh, this is true or this, this is false, that tells you that it's a mathematical statement. Similarly, you could say x squared is greater than zero when x equals three. You could say it's greater than zero for all real numbers, x. You could say x squared is greater than zero for all natural numbers, x. Or you could go a different direction and say there is at least one real number x with x squared greater than zero. I'll let you think about whether these statements are true or false, um, but we agree that they are um, mathematical statements. Let's move on to quantifiers. We often want to prove statements about all numbers or objects of a certain class. For example, all integers or all primes, something like that. And sometimes we want to show that there exists a number or object of a certain property. So we might want to show that there is a number such that two times that number is the one you start with, things like this. So because we often use these types of constructions for alls and their exists, uh, we give them symbols and we give them names. So if you want to describe things like for all or for any or every, then we use a universal quantifier, this upside down A. If instead you want to talk about there exists or there is or for some, then you would use an existential quantifier, this backwards capital E. Let's look at how we might use these. Let's consider the statement. Um, well, I'm not going to read it because as soon as I read it, it will tell you what it is. What does this statement say? By the way, this symbol right here means in. So uh, we're going to read this as x in the real numbers. We'll get back to it um, when we talk about uh, set theory. So let's read this. There exists an x in the real numbers such that x squared is greater than zero. There is a real number x with x squared greater than zero. You can take a moment to think about whether you think this is true or not. What happens if we use a universal quantifier? How would you read this? This reads as, for every real number x, it is true that x squared is greater than zero. I'll let you think about whether that is a true statement or a false statement. One piece of notation that we're going to use throughout the course is um, we'll have properties that x can have and we'll call them p of x. So for example, we might have the property x is even or x is rational. And this notation uh, we'll use is something like exists an x p of x. That will mean there is an x with the property p of x. So for example, there is an even number. And for all x p of x will mean every x has the property p of x. Notice here that I haven't said where x lives um, and you can often specify the scope of it um, in your question as well, or in your statement. Uh, for here, I didn't leave the scope because I thought, I, I didn't put the scope because I thought it would be a little bit confusing. But in mathematical statements, you'll often say the scope. There exists an x in the reals with p of x, or for all x in the rationals, something. Uh, 
A mathematical statement can have many quantifiers. So a statement is read left to right if there are many quantifiers. Variables on the right can depend on earlier variables. Let's look at some examples of this. Here's a statement with multiple quantifiers. What is it trying to say? Take a moment to express it in English in a way that doesn't involve quantifiers or in a way that um, someone in grade five would understand. This statement is saying, out of all of the students, for, or for every student in the course, there is an N such that N is the name of P. A, a way of saying this in a less stilted way is, every student in the course has a name. Do you believe that? Is that true? Yes, of course that's true. Everyone has a name. Let's look at this next uh, sentence. The only difference is that I've exchanged the existential quantifier and the universal quantifier. So these two are in different orders. Let's read this. There is a name such that for every student in the course, N is their name. Now the thing that makes this confusing is that we chose N at the beginning. So we chose N before we even started talking about students. So what this is actually saying is there is a name such that every single student in the course has that, that one name. So this second one is saying everyone in the course has the same name. This first one was saying every student has a name. Are these two statements the same? Well, no, of course not. Let's look at some other ways that we can uh, change up these statements. Here we're not going to change the order, we're going to change uh, what quantifiers we're using. So statement three here is the same as statement one. And this one's going to be a little bit silly, but let's read it. There is a student in the course such that for every name, N is their name. So what is this saying? It's saying there's a student with uh, every single possible name. So it's like some sort of elder horror. Um, it has unspeakably many names. And then finally, I took part two and I exchanged the quantifiers. So I turned the there exists into a for all. And what does this one say? It says, for every name, there is a student in the course where N is their name. So all of the names that are possible are represented in the course. Is that true? Well, there's definitely under, uh, a, like definitely under 10,000 people in the course and there are more than 10,000 names possible. So this is not going to be true. Here are some exercises for you to understand this con these concepts a little bit better. Finish the definition using quantifiers. An integer x is even if, and then express it using quantifiers. Finish this definition using only quantifiers. A natural number n is composite if, for the third one, express this as a mathematical statement. For every positive real number, there is a number between it and zero. And then finally, a harder one, express the following as a mathematical statement with mixed quantifiers. There is a smallest natural number. For this fourth one, uh, we don't want you to just give the number or the answer one. We want you to express the, the there is a smallest number. That's the important part that you're trying to quantify. So that when you express there is no smallest number in the reals, um, you can still express that mathematically. Finally, let's take some time to reflect. Why do we care about mathematical statements? How are they related to conjectures and theorems? One thing that often happens is that students have a hard time constructing quantifiers and or constructing statements with quantifiers, and they'll make constructions like the following. So how would you feel if your grade in the course was there exists an X such that X over 100? What would you feel like if I wrote that on your final exam? What does it take to show that a statement 
for all x p of x is false. What do you have to do? Finally, come up with a statement that uses three quantifiers. All of the ones that we saw in this video were one quantifier or two quantifiers. Find one with three. Thank you very much for watching the video.